Today is October 17th, 2014, and I'm here with a World War II veteran. His name is Paul Miano. Can you please introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Paul Miano, a World War II veteran. Which what was your branch of service in World War II, sir? I was in the uh, engineers, Army engineers at Fort Belmar, Virginia. I went down to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. From there, I went to Port of Embarkation in San Francisco at Camp Stolman. Left there, landed in New Guinea. Well, first, yeah, we landed there. Well, first, we stopped in Australia for I don't know to take out more food or something. And then we went to New Guinea. And from New Guinea, when the campaign was over there, we went to the Philippines. And But my outfit was a very unique outfit. We were all over the Pacific. We had 30 men in Bayak. We had men in Newfork. We had men in uh, Lay. We repaired strips. We put up uh, tanks for petroleum, for, for the airplane, for, for the air corp, and naturally the jeeps and trucks. We had to know how many trucks, jeeps, uh, how much gasoline we needed every day to operate. Everything depended on our outfit. Food, clothing, everything. If we didn't have the gas, they couldn't move. I think we got a citation from General Eichenberger for an outstanding achievement job in our outfit. I have that all in our company book. I'll let you read that after. So did you recall the date you started World War II? Yeah, I went into service on uh, August 23, 1943. And uh, I went 19... I think it was September of 43 or 44, we went to uh, part of a vacation, we went to New Guinea, and then the Philippines, and then we hit Japan. We were the first outfit in Japan, because we had to repair the Asugi airstrip so our Air Force could come in. In fact, the Levitt Airborne, instead of landing with their planes, they, they jumped on the strip. Uh, the airport, they, they didn't land, they, 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 they jumped and, uh, because we didn't have to feel ready for them yet. Why did you pick to serve in that branch of World War II? Well, I went to go up to Fort Belvoir, I was going to go to OCS, but I was only just a high school graduate and all the college guys were getting drafted and they were going ahead of us and they put me in a, in a replacement depot, and I wound up in the engineers. That's that's how I got there. I didn't ask for it. They asked me if I wanted a servant, and I, I agreed to it. Tell me about your first days of service as uh, our army. The first days of service? Yes. Well, that was up in uh, Camp Devons. I stayed there, wait for we were deployed to, but uh, they had no place, and that's what they sent us to go for. And, uh, but I had military experience before I went to the Riverside Military Academy for two years in Gainesville, Georgia. So the Army was no stranger to me. I, I knew about Army life, camping, firing a rifle. I did all that. So can you tell me about some of the weapons you used? Yes, we used... Uh, I used, uh, we had an M30, and then I went to a carby, and very seldom we had BARs, that's a Browning Automatic Machine Gun. You could fire it automatically, you could fire it single. But the carbine was our best weapon in, uh, in the Pacific. So how was your experiences in the boot camp that you've been to? I know you said you've been to Fort a lot. Um, you've been to Virginia, the, the one in Virginia. 
Yeah, I, I was in uh, I, I was in uh, Fort Belvoir. Fort Belvoir. Yeah, Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And that was a very big camp because we were outside outside of Washington. And uh, Highway US One went right through our camp. Well, I'm like, I'm going to go down. We had to be back early. Do you remember some of your instructors? Do I know some of my instructors? Yes. Yeah. What do you mean, my captains and stuff? Yes, your captains. Yeah, I had, uh, well, one of my lieutenants was Lieutenant Greenfall, and our captain was, uh, he was a petroleum man from Oklahoma. Now it just, it just, my mind's a little blank on that. Uh, captain Copeland, Copeland was our captain. He, he was from Oklahoma, and he was a petroleum man. So what were some of your first impressions of your captain? Like, did you and him get along, or how was your, how well, did you feel? in those days, where everybody was gone home to, to win. We got along, but we, I would say everybody got along much better than they do today. Today, it's uh, too much politics. In the old days, we just want to get it over with and win and come home. So did you see any combat? I saw it, but I wasn't in it. I mean, we got, we were putting up a, an installation and uh, we had a couple of men hurt. In fact, I even got a letter from a guy you have to walk, Donald Moffat was his name. He was from Milford, Connecticut. And uh, so I sent him a little berserk and he was in the hospital for quite a while. And uh, so like I said, we were, our outfit was, we were all over the place. We deployed groups of 10 to 30 to 40 groups all over the island, wherever we were needed for demolition or putting up tanks. Mostly that was our thing, putting up petroleum tanks. So were there any casualties in your unit? Uh, see, a lot of guys I didn't know, yeah, but I think out of our original company, when we left and come home, I think we were only about seven of the original. I ain't going to say they got killed, they got transferred, uh, which I don't know. They got transferred or they went to different places, or they stayed in companies that wherever they were located at. Were you a prisoner of war? No, I wasn't. I wasn't a prisoner of war. Can you show me um, or share with me any medals or citations you received? Or well, I got them on my hat. That if you give me my discharge paper, I can read to what I got. Here, yeah. sir. Thank you. Oh, you gave me the wrong one. That's not good. Uh, wait there. No, no. Wait a minute. Yeah, this is it. This is my discharge papers. I got the victory medal. Is it yeah. anyone? Let me see that one that's not it. Right oh, yeah. all the medals. This is his paper. Some of the medals he received during the war. That's on my discharge papers. And this is his discharge paper. Can you read it, sir, please? Sure, I'll read it. Thank you. Uh, medals are Asiatic Pacific Theater Campaign Ribbon, the Philippine Liberation Ribbon with one bronze star and a service star, Good Contact Medal, and the American Theater Campaign Ribbon. Wow. How did you get them? Well, you had to be in, this, in those places. Oh. Like you had to be the Asiatic Pacific Theater, which I was in the I was in the American theater, I was in the Philippine theater. So were you in a higher rank? Uh, uh, I was in, uh, I was a, a T5. That's a corporal. Okay. So, um, did you ex have any battle planning? Any what? Battle planning? Battle what? Battle planning? I had battle training. Oh yeah, okay. we had a lot of training. 
that we went to. We did everything, fired every rep, every kind of a weapon there was, went through gas chambers. Did you um, have any injuries during your experience in World War II? The only one I had is malaria. I contacted malaria. And where did you contact Man malaria? In New Guinea. But I stayed in the service. I had to bring this, keep the fever away. But when I came home and stopped taking the Adabrine, I wound up in the hospital about two or three times. So remember you um, mentioned to me that you were in a car accident? What did that I got take? hit by a weapons carrier, a truck. And where we was were, we were packing up we were packing up to go to Japan. And that happened in the Philippines, you that said? That happened in the Philippines, yeah. Okay. I was in the hospital just for a couple of days because I wanted to go with my outfit. We went to Japan. We landed at Yokosuka. So I know uh, Yokohama, I mean, we landed at Yokohama. We had a petroleum base on Yokosuka. So I know in our society today, te technology is so advanced, but I'm just curious about how did you communicate with family back then? Because I know technology is not like how it was today. Mail. So you contacted family through mail? Just through mail. You could make no telephone call. Right? The only place you could make a telephone call was when you were going overseas, but you were just, you had a signal. You could say I was in part of the and I'm leaving for overseas. You could just say, well, I'll write to you as soon as I get to my des destination. <coughs> and then you could never tell them where you were if you were in New Guinea, somewhere in the South Pacific or something like that. In fact, if I could show you some of my letters, people that wrote us, we just have to take their address out. Oh, I'll get it. Let's see. Let's see. He's going to show me some of the letters. Well, I'm going to show you one, give you an example. Like if you received mail, you had to cut their address out. You had to cut that. If you saved your mail, a lot of guys used to throw their mail. But this was for my girlfriend, so I saved this one. <laughs> it was a nice letter, so this is one of them I saved. But you can see there's her address is missing there. Wow. Can you see? So then we Her name. I imagine they didn't want to contact the people. Here, sir. Thank you. What was the food like in the army? It wasn't too bad. You had powdered eggs and powdered milk. You couldn't wait to get home to get milk. And milk was the biggest thing that everybody wanted. Did you have enough supplies? We always had plenty, plenty of supplies. We even not. In fact, we had too much. We used to give it to, they had to put a stop to that. We used to give it to the natives because a lot of them were starving in the Philippines, the Guinea. So do you feel any like pressure or stress about the war? Especially I know missing your family back at home. I know that's... In those days? Yes. Oh yeah, that's missing girlfriend the most. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything special you did for good luck? Well, I was a believer in going to church. I used to go to church whenever I could. How did people entertain themselves? I know nowadays we have MP3 players, iPods. I'm just curious to... Well, we didn't entertain too much. Just sometimes like Bob Hope came over or we, they put on some movie actors came over. And they put on shows. I saw I saw Bob Hope and his shows. I saw uh, Leo DeRocher, he came over. Uh, what's his name there? That guy used to sing, Tembolina. 
it's just funny that he was a movie actor. A lot of movies stars came over, that was our only entertainment. But most of the time, we either we were working or were on the move because we fought an offensive war. We kept moving all the time. So did you want to go on leave at all during the war? No. No? No leave. Do you call any humor, humorous or unusual events? Any what? Humorous, like any funny events or unusual events during the experience during the war? No, I never thought about that, no. Like, yeah. The only humor we used to get in events was when the actors came over, that was about it. Bob Hope was the biggest attraction there. No matter where he was, you try to get to see him. Bob Hope, you Bob said? Hope. Okay. Yeah. He used to entertain the troops. Yeah, Terry Colonna. Uh, these guys are all gone. What are some pranks that you may have pulled on others or others would pull? Or, what do you mean? Like, you know, were there any, like, pranks or any, like, brotherhood jokes you would make with one another during the war? Mm -hmm. Things were different. And we were more serious about what was going on. But like I said, we were always on the move. We were always packing. We were always, you were always leaving where you were. You put your, get to a place, you get all set up and you had to leave again. You either went to work, you went to a different island. So very fast paced. Yeah. What what do you think of your fellow officers or your fellow servicemen? Well, those days the officers worked right along with the men. They were, it was, it was a different than the army than today. Uh, everybody was, especially overseas, everybody was close to one another. Uh, the officers were had respect for their men. I imagine they do today, but uh, it was more like a brotherhood in those days. They worked along with you. I'll never forget a new lieutenant came from the state with a shirt and bars on. He wanted to meet the captain. When I brought up to the captain, he couldn't believe it. The captain had no shirt, no bars. <laughs> he says, I'm trying to get used to this. Take your shirt and bars off. He says, it's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> Did you keep a journal? Not really, no. I didn't get, but that was that was forbidden during the war. So where um, did you live after the service your service ended? After you came back from World War Two? I went back home with my mother and father. That was in forty six and then forty seven I got married and I moved out. And what location was that? Where did you I work? moved I moved I still stayed in Hartford. I moved from uh, Cheshire Street to Huge Street. I got an apartment for my wife and I on Huge Street. And I went in the restaurant business. I had Mickey's on Market Street with my father's business, but he moved up to Main Street and I was running the one on Market Street in Hartford. Did you ever go back to school? No. I got married instead. I, I was thinking about going back to school, but she waited too long for me to come home, so I might as well get married, and I got married. But I did all right. But our marriage, first marriage, didn't last long. My wife died after the third childbirth. She, we were married only eight and a half years. She had she developed cancer of the breast. Did you make any close friends in, in during the service? Yes, I did. Can you give me some of their names? Well, Donald Moffat. He was from Milford, Connecticut. Uh, oh my God! I'm drawing a blank. It's okay. It's, uh, but we kept it told, but I'm the only survivor. They're all gone. Oh my gosh. Um, so what did you do 
as a career after your service? Just the restaurant work that you mentioned? I went in the restaurant business, then I went into real estate. We had our own company. I am a realty company. How did your um, military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? What do I think? The military was all right, but the war was lousy. It, uh, we, we did what we had to do. That was about it. That's the way the attitude was in those days. Did you ever feel a sense of fright or fear? Yeah, a lot of times. How did you learn how to cope with that fear? We depended on each other. After a while, like if you heard bombing and stuff, after a while you got used to it. It's just like a guy fights going into the ring. The first one, the bell hits, he knows he's got to fight, and that's it. Did you join any veteran organizations? Yeah, I, I belong in the American Legion, but uh, I don't go anymore. Today it's a lot different than the old days. I still belong to it, though. Do you attend any reunions? There is no one here that seems to thank God. How did your service and experiences affect your life? It gave me a happy life. I, the experience I got in the, well, I learned how to live with one another. That's the way we lived in those days. It's a lot different than today. Is there any last thing you would like to add in this interview that I haven't asked you or anything you want to share with the viewers across the world? No, I think that's about it. Uh, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't one that came home and, like a lot of kids today, like I, I got a grandson who's gone. He was in the... Uh, his buddy got killed. In fact, this is his shirt, Marine shirt. It was my grandson. He got blown up in Iraq, and his buddy right next to him got killed. And he's been in the hospital quite long. I got some pictures of him. He really got in a bad way. And he has bad memories instead of good memories. And ours was, we knew we won the war. That was a big, big thing, winning that war. These are some of his pictures during training in um, Fort Belvoir. Fort Belvoir. They can't claim her. In Virginia. No. Yeah. And he's right there to the far bottom left of this picture. And I'm going to zoom in so you can see closely. That's him right there in the middle. And this is another picture of him up top. And this is Fort Belvoir. No, Camp Claiborne. One is Camp Claiborne, one is Fort Belvoir. This is that's Camp Claiborne. No. Let's see. No, um, this that's oh, yeah, Fort Belvoir. Belvoir. They're both yeah. Fort Belvoir. Yeah, yeah. both Fort Belvoir. And yeah. this is Fort Belvoir. Yeah. Yeah. First Battalion Company B. And that's him right there. All the way to the end. That's him, where I'm pointing at. And then the picture that I showed you before. Yeah, right here. That's him right there. And this is his hat. His veteran hat of World War II. So I just want to thank you, sir, for your gratitude and for serving our country. Thank and you. no, World War II was not an easy war. It was, you know, a lot of a lot of pain and anguish to to win that war and to even go back home to your family and relive your life. I know that must have been a challenge. So, so is there anything else you would like to add? 
or you're all set? Uh, I wish today they had the same feeling that we had those days about this country. Here, Paul Miano is going to discuss this photo that he's holding in his hand. Um, the photo is about New Guinea. He's just going to talk about it. That's him right there. Um, he's, yep, he's going to talk about it, discuss. Well, this the, is a photo of me. I was in a, in a field hospital in New Guinea. I had a fungus on my hands, my feet, in between my crotch. And so they were treating me just, this was almost just like MASH, it's just saw in the movies. And you could see the little hospital, the little beds there, the little tents I mean, that we lived in. And the big one was where the medics took care of us. These were all sick patients, but we were getting ready to leave here. And we were going, uh, I was still with my outfit, 1383rd, and we were going to go into, uh, we was, in a couple of weeks, we'll leave it for, uh, for the Philippines. And while we were waiting, we for, I formed a laundry that we used to wash the guys' clothes. We used to use 55-gallon drums, and we had a wheel that used to turn. We cut a hole into the 55 drums. When the wheel turned, it was like a paddle washing the clothes. And uh, that, that was... The first laundry in New Guinea from the United States Army. Cool. So, um, how did you wash clothes back then? Was it a river you went to, or? Well, yeah, the natives used to wash most of our clothes, but we had a. We used to have what once a week that they would come and gather your clothes. They had the big washes, but when you were out in the field, like I was over here. Uh, very seldom did they come there, maybe once a month. So we started, uh, I started our own laundry. How often did you guys wash clothes each week? In, um... Well, once we got the laundry, you wash them as often as you want. But it's cost you a dollar. We charge the dollar a head to wash the clothes, no matter. They just give, bring it in their duffel bags. What else um, you used to do in your leisure time at New Guinea with the well, army? Well, we, we, were, we were taking down some of the tanks that we built storage for gasoline. And they were going to put them back on ships and bring them up to, uh, to the Philippines. We, we were going to go up to the Philippines. We landed them. And when we did go to the Philippines, we landed in the Lang uh, Langan Gulf in, in the Philippines. That was up in Luzon. And I have pictures when we took Clark Field. I met my uncle there. He was my, he wasn't my uncle then, he was just my, give me a picture, I'll show you the picture of my uncle. But this is, these are the tanks. You want to take a picture of the yeah. tanks? Mm -hmm. I'll zoom in here. Yeah. Uh, these. these are the picture of the tanks that we used to build. They were 10,000 barrel tanks. And they held... 100 octane gas for the air for or 120, and 80 octane we used to use for trucks and jeeps. And nobody could move without us. Everything depended on the gasoline. We were just like uh, Patton's uh, reserve gasoline organization, the Red Ball, Red Ball Express. So that gasoline tank um, that's in that's in New Guinea or the Philippines? This is in the New, this is New Guinea. New we Guinea, were okay. Just starting to take those down. That's when I got the fungus. So did you ever like um, oh the fungus? So how long did it take your body to like heal from all of that? Well, they they had a solution that worked very good. But I got rid of it in about a week. Okay, and I but I couldn't handle water or gasoline, but. The, I could work on the tanks, take them down, as long as there was no, no gasoline, no water, till, till they healed completely. So were like the nurses that took care of you? Like no, the they weren't nurses. We had medics. They were army medics. Army medics. We didn't have any nurses in, in the field, uh, in, this, in these hospitals. This is out in the jungles. We cleared this area out. 
just for this purpose. This was really thick brush when we first started that well, Not me, but the engineers, they cleaned it all out. And there was a lot of snakes. They switched that to burn the snakes. We so did you ever get area. bit by a snake? They were very poisonous. Wow. They were, in fact, you only had 15 seconds to live you if you didn't get the thing on it. And I'm trying to think of that. The venom? Yeah. I'm trying to think of the snake. It was, uh, it was uh, a very poisonous snake. Uh, when, you, when I was there, I knew all the snakes. <laughs> Sir, and um, can I see that picture of you when you were in the war? That um, uh, This is a picture of me in Japan. The war was over. This was September 12, 1945. I had this picture taken in Japanese by a Japanese ph photographer. So like when you came back from the day, do you recall like your like how did everyone like treat you like the day you came back like from Japan? Like how was it like going well, back? Well the people were, when we came back they had big bands playing for us. I landed in uh, California and uh, it was like a big celebration and we had to actually go through all physicals and everything. Then the troop trains, people would be along all, all along the railroads waving the American flag at us, thanking us for our service. Sir, so like after like you came back from the war and you said you came back to California. Yeah. Like how did it like did you miss the war? Like were you happy to be home or did oh, you I was like very happy to be home. Okay, awesome. So and how did your family greet you? My family well my mother was gone into the hospital. She had a tumor in her breast, and uh, she wouldn't let them go. She knew I was coming home that day at the ambulance. When I got there, I was wondering what the ambulance was doing in front of my house. But first, I stopped to see my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then my father called. I called over there and told him what it was. He says, you got to come right away because we're taking your mother to the hospital. And he says, I'll explain to you later. She's not sick. So they went and they did a biopsy on it, which was a malignant. So um any close friends that you um that you still keep in contact with? Like after after the war or that are alive today? Well I was keeping in contact with a lot of my friends, but most of them are all gone now. now I'm gonna be ninety in February and most of them were a little older than me, a year older or nine months older than I, I was. I was one of the youngest guys in the outfit. But this, we still have, we still meet, there's a but, but now it's not, it's only three of us veterans from World War II that are left. We meet every first Friday. We have breakfast together. But now we, there's Korean, Vietnam, uh, we, we take any veterans in that they can come, or if they're from the east side of Hartford. So where do you meet at? Um, we meet at the place to be on Franklin Avenue. Franklin Avenue in Hartford? In okay. Hartford. Okay. We're every first Friday. Okay. Um, is there any, like, awards that you receive from the war, like, which one do you find most memorable or that you cherish or that you... Well, they're all in the back of my discharge. I had them all. I had the Good Conduct Medal. I had the Asiatic Pacific Battle. I had the uh, Bronze Star. I don't, we have to get my discharge. I have to read the back of it. Okay. Uh, the Philippine Liberation. Um... Sir, uh, any like um, any of the people like the sergeants that train you like the leadership skills and qualities? Do you like um, do you cherish those? Can you can like can you please tell me like some of the training, like how intense it was? Like what did you have to do? 
The training was very intensive one way. We've gone to basic training. But I was fortunate. I went to military school before I went in the Army. I was going to Riverside Military Academy in Gainesville, Georgia. In Hollywood, Florida, we had two schools. In the winter, we'd be in Florida, and the summer, we'd be in Georgia. I mean, the, in the winter, yeah, the summer in Georgia, and the winter in Florida. And so when I went in the Army, I was acting like a sergeant. I was on cadre. We went to Fort Belvoir. I was going. To, I was going to go to try to go to OCS. The Fort Belvoir is in Louisiana. In Virginia. Oh, Fort, Virginia. Yeah. Okay. Fort to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. It's right outside of Washington. The highway US one runs right through it. And uh, but there was a lot of college guys way ahead of me and our crew. They sent us down to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana, and we were going to start to work with General Patton. He was at Camp Livingston, and they were bringing German and Italian prisoners up in New Jersey. So I missed going in with Patton. I stayed at Camp Claiborne because I was going up to up to uh, Newark, New York, uh, Newark, New Jersey, to pick up German and Italian soldiers. And you would think that they they were friends, but they were the worst. En they were worst enemies than we were at our enemies. We had to separate them in different cars. But when I got back to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana, uh, Patton already left. He left for Africa. And uh, they, I went into a replacement depot, and I had no chance of going to OCS, and they shipped me out to the Pacific. I was in a, that's a, I, I went to this outfit first. I was in a replacement depot. I went into this was a new organization, 1383rd Engineers. So they put me in that, and we went to the Pacific. We went out to California, and from California, part of embarkation, we went straight to New Guinea. And that's how I wound up at this outfit. It was a new formed organization, and we were all specialists. I went to school for demolition. I was uh, the demolition in the company. I used to blow up things. And we had at that time, it was a military secret. We had Composition C and we had uh, Primer Corps. Primer Corps detonated four miles per second. You could put charges within four miles any way you wanted, one mile this way, one mile another way. And when you hit the revitalizer, simultaneously it would detonate. And uh, that was, I was, I, I built tanks, I built roads, I put it, but if I was needed for demolition, there was three of us, Heavey, Burke, and myself. And uh, we used to do all the demolition work. We never went over or anything, we went through everything. If there was a little mountain, we went through it. We blew holes so they could lay pipe through it for gasoline. And... I did that until the war ended. I went from New Guinea to the Philippines. There was a lot of little islands we went to, but there are too many of the name. I showed you that in my book there. We went to Bayak, known for, and all different places where we had to do specialized work. We were a company. We were never together. We were always somewhere different. Bands were all, 10, 10 would be here, 15 would be in another place. We even operated white boats. A white boat was a Fulton gasoline tank, was a thousand, ga ba a thousand barrel tank with, uh, <clears throat> with a motor on it. And we would deliver gasoline, We used, especially in New Guinea, with Lake Santana, which is supposed to be one of the biggest lakes in the world. And uh, we used to transport our own gasoline. I mean, we had as much tonnage and, as the Navy had in the Pacific. We, we used to deliver all over with gasoline. We set up gas stations. We set up uh, things for ships that needed bunker that came from the States. And we had a lot of storage. In fact, we got a citation, which I think I showed you, for General Eichelberger for uh, our work again, when that was accomplished. Because we were never, never, as a unit, all together, the only time we were together 
That's when the war ended and we went to Japan. And that's about it. So I know um, how you guys were so like divided, but I know you guys had, it was like a brotherhood. Yes, Can it was. Can you like please Well, the, the three of us, like I says, Burke, uh, his name was Berkowitz, he was a Jewish kid, and, and he, he, he was from Illinois, he was Irish, and myself, I was from Connecticut, my we were, uh, we always just knock each other with our nationalities, I was telling we were the greatest without us, you'd be still washing, washing your, <laughs> you, you, we had to teach you how to take baths, we all went, we used to rap on that, but like we were family, and I missed them for a long time, even after I got out of the service. But the three of us were together most of the time. In fact, I used to go to the, to the synagogue with Burke on, on a Saturday. He used to come to church with me on Sunday. We had open out masses in those days. And that's how close we used to be. So can I um at question you, like, do you think the war today has any of those, like, brotherhood or values? What is, like, your opinion on war today? compared to war back then? Well, we fought an offensive war by being mad with our faith. We never stopped in one place. We were going forward all the time. That was our mission. Our mission was to keep going. To de our enemy fought a defensive war, and we had to take that away, their positions away from them. But today, it's a political war. It's... Uh, it's up to the president or it's up to the senators. Or, uh, the, I don't think the generals have as much say as they did in World War II. And my grandson, the one I showed you the picture, that was blown up. He was blown up for no reason at all. Uh, there, uh, like he said, uh, there wasn't that the unity that we had. But the fellows that, that weren't blown up, you want me to keep talking? Yeah. Follow that he, uh, the, 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 when the, his, uh, the other buddies were killed. Yeah, this is my grandson. You, there's pictures over there after he was blown up. They want those. This so, is my grandson who f was blown up in Felucia six months after this picture was taken. Um, so I know you said that he was blown up for no reason at all. Can you please well, just go into the details? Well, the reason details? he was blown up was the security wasn't as tight as it should have been. And uh, like he said, when you do something every day, you get lax, day in and day out. They were fired upon, and I got a lot of pictures of the buildings that they were in that were fired on. So, um, like... um. What's what war? I mean, what part um, of the country did he? Um, he was in Fallujah in uh, in Iraq. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I was just talking to him on the phone. He still got a lot of scars. He still they still take a shrapnel out of him after six years. He he went and inspected a, a taxi cab, and the taxi cab had two women. Now they didn't know one was a young girl and the other was an older woman. And the taxi cab driver blew up the cab, killed three of the Marines, but my grandson survived. That's very tragic. Yeah. Just a blessing that he's alive. I got pictures of him where he was blown up. They're over there. They're under one of those papers with the end there. So, yeah. I, this is him. Six. This is him. Jason Michael Isaac. So can you move your hand down? Um, yeah, thank you. He, 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 he was, th this picture was six months after his, his, when he left the States. He was ready to come home. He volunteered for this. And he, he came home about a year later. He went to the hospital in Germany. And then from Germany, he went to uh, Texas to the Burn Center. So what year did this happen? 06. 2006? 2006. Okay. Yeah, he's very close with a lot of his friends. They keep in touch with each other. So, um, are there any last words you would like to add, sir, about your grandson and or about um, World War II? 
Well, we always used to think we were going to go to the Golden Gate in 48. That used to be a song. But we made it back in 46. That's when I went under. I got a picture of the Golden Gate, too. I took a picture. But maybe it's here. No, it's got to be in one of those pads underneath that picture there. Uh, the, the, in the, the books, there's a book of pictures. Those books, no, look, look. Right next to that big thing with the elastic on, there's some books. Huh? No, no, over here. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. No, no, the next, the, the, the books. The, 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 you had your hand on it. Oh, here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is, I think the Golden Gate Bridges is one of these pictures. These are all pictures when I left Japan and everything. Here's a picture of me leaving Japan. Hey, you, you gotta get some of these out of my hands. Yeah, I'll take some. I'll take this out of here. You gotta take these out too. Okay, well done. Thank you. Hey, let's see. Could you get this? This is a picture when I was leaving Japan. Yes. That's when you, the, after the war ended, that was... Yeah, was when I was Japan. coming home. You were coming home. Okay. Yeah, this was in January. January what? Can you tell me the date? I would think the... it was around January 10th. January 10th, 19... 1946. Okay. And then there's... Picture of me and my friends were on a boat on the ship, the Admiral Caps. We came home on the Admiral Caps. We were headed for uh, California. You want some more pictures? Yes, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, I think the pictures on the ship. Let's see. This is the harbor in Japan. This is the harbor in, in Japan. And we crossed the harbor to get on the train. That, that first picture I showed you. And now this here is, I'm board, this is where I'm boarding the ship going home. So, so, like, how was the ships back then? Like, how did they, like, oh, they had, board everyone? They, they, they wall to wall people. <laughs> it was some, it was a lot of people stayed up on deck all night if it was nice. And then his, it was the Golden Gate that we went through. Now, I hit, I hit Japan, uh, California. We hit California around the end of January, the beginning of February. Any more photos, sir, you would like to share? Let's see. Uh, these are all pictures leaving Japan. Let's see what these are. Oh, uh, these are pictures that with the natives I took in New Guinea. Yeah, can you show me some of those? Uh, here's is a picture of my friend Ceruto. He was very sick. You can see how thin he was. He just came back from the hospital. He was wounded. So that's Ceruto on the right or the left side? Uh, on the right side? Uh, Ceruto's on the left. That's me on the right. Uh, let me see. Yeah, it's me on the right. And there's a little native boy, a New Guinea boy. It, it was fascinating. He watched. He was watching a guy had a flat tire on a truck, and he was amazed how a little jack lift up this truck. He's trying to lift up the truck with his hand like the jack. He, he was surprised. He never saw a jack before. Cool. Let's see. Then we had, there's a picture of the queen. Is, is it a picture of the 
queen. She was a, a queen in Hollandia. She went to school in England and she came back to Africa, I mean to New Guinea, and started a school for the children there. She, they were starting to educate them. That's pretty interesting. So um, how did you help them? Well, we used to give them food. We used to help them with food and medicine because they had, they had no doctors or anything. So, so since they had no doctors, was they like was disease and sickness prevalent? Uh, no, they were hard workers. I, I I think their immune systems were were great. Yeah, they had sick people, but not like well, they died young there. Okay? They died in their forties. In their twenties, they were old for crying out. Uh, I mean, in their thirties, they were old. Anything else you, any more photos you would like to share? Well, yeah, I was at, I went to a pygmy camp. He's a pygmy soldier. He had a rifle, so he was holding me up. <laughs> he took me a prisoner. Thank you, sir. Okay.